does this do here? I always forget. It mutes it? Yeah. It mutes who? Yeah. Or mutes all of them? Where's Mr. Samidia? Maybe it's right over there. Good afternoon, everybody. The Committee on Appropriations is called to order. It is approximately 3.05 p.m. Noticing the absence of a quorum, we will begin as a subcommittee. Uh, sergeants, if you could be so kind enough uh, to do me the favor and call the absent members so we can establish a quorum. I want to welcome everybody to the Committee on the Assembly on Appropriations, uh, the fifth extraordinary session. We have two measures before us today, SB2 in the fifth extraordinary session by Senator Joe Simidian. Mr. Simidian, welcome. And we also have AB8 by Ms. Julia Brownlee. Chair of the Education Committee of the Assembly also in the Extraordinary Fifth Session. Both measures, SB2, X5, as well as AB8, X5, are due pass as amended. The amendments are reflected in the staff analysis that is before you today. Again, let me underscore to the Sergeant, if I can get your attention, if you could be so kind enough to call the absent members so we can establish a quorum. Again, we will begin as a subcommittee. So, before us right now in the first row, Mr. Samidian, if you could be so kind enough, Senator, to grace us with your elegant presence. Good afternoon, Mr. Samidian. Let me try that again. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members. This bill. Uh, develops a process by July 1st of the coming year for reviewing and responding to requests for individual pupil data records that are housed in the California Longitudinal Pupil Achievement Data System, CALPADS as it's colloquially referred to. It also works uh, towards developing the larger uh, pre-K through uh, 20 comprehensive longitudinal data system and provide stakeholder access. Uh, as you will recall, Mr. Chairman and members, the federal guidelines for Race to the Top require stakeholder access. Uh, that's one of the missing pieces of the existing CalPad system. Uh, I wanted to uh, indicate for your observation, Mr. Chairman, that we're happy to accept the amendments that have been proposed by, for the bill by the Education Committee. Uh, I think the only other thing I would say is the bill has garnered support from a really nice cross-section. Folks in the uh, education community, including the California State PTA, folks like Children Now, also folks in the law enforcement community, folks like Fight Crime, Invest in Kids, uh, folks in the social justice world, but also folks in the business community. So both the LA Chamber of Commerce and the Bay Area Council representing the largest businesses in Northern California and the Bay Area uh, have been supportive of the bill as well as the University of California and County of Los Angeles. Um, I do want to indicate uh, that uh, we think that some of the cost concerns which are uh, referenced in the, in the analysis of the bill relate to the development of a pre-kindergarden through 20th, um, uh, grade 20 uh, higher education level database. Those are commitments, Mr. Chair and members, that have already been made. That, 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 that bus is already rolled out of the station. It's that separate. Is, and that, that's separate, and we've already made that commitment. We not only made it statutorily, we made those assurances when we took $5 billion from the federal government and our funds, so we need to honor that commitment so we don't put the $5 billion we took at risk of someone claiming we have not lived up to our assurances. With that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to take a, a respect and I vote. Senator Simeon, I, I will say that uh, when you uh, analyze uh, your bill, uh, SB number 2, uh, X5, uh, there are uh, significant uh, cost pressures to the general fund as well as Prop 98. However, I know the vast majority of these uh, monies would be offset by either the race to the top dollars or other uh, uh, revenues uh, of federal funding. Uh, so with that, um, let's go to the witnesses uh, in support of SB 2 X5. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brett. Thank you. Brad Strong with Children Now in support. Chris Reef on behalf of State Superintendent of Je uh, <laughs> Public Construction, Jack O'Connell in support. Thank you. Erica Hoffman on behalf of the California School Boards Association also in support of the measure. 
Sherry Griffith with the Association of California School Administrators in support. Any other support? Mr. Chair, members of committee, Chris Walker on behalf of the California Association of Sheet Metal Air Conditioning Contractors, California Industrial Technology Education Association, and the California Automotive Business Coalition. Um, with reference to the discussion on amendments yesterday taken to this bill, the committee discussed at length the need to include a career technical education data collection component. Let me hold you on that real quick. I, I think that, uh, and perhaps um, I would recommend that you have a sidebar conversation uh, with uh, Mr. Torlakson on that issue. I think there has been a consensus and agreement to how to go about doing that and which vehicle will be the proper vehicle between uh, Mr. Smedian as well as Ms. Brownlee. Um, I think that you may be satisfied that would be addressed when Ms. Brownlee comes and addresses us. I just don't want to, uh, 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 and I do know your concerns are that of Mr. Hansen also too. I, I think you'll be satisfied. Fair enough. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. I want to, uh, any other witnesses in support? If I see none, uh, Madam Secretary, please call uh, the roll. I, uh, Absolutely. Go ahead, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to Senator Smitty, I know you and I had the conversation about the issue of the data collection on career technical education programs, and you as an author, uh, I want to ask you, would you be favorable to towards that? I think because of time constraints today and mocking up legislation, this would not be appropriate in your bill, but on a policy basis, are you okay with that uh, intent language to have such data collected for career technical education programs per the amendment we talked about? Through the chair. Um, no problem. I, my own view is that the bill already speaks to the entire range of data that needs to be collected. Understandably, there are folks who have specific areas of interest. They would like to make sure that their areas get called out. As long as that is done as intent language, clarifying so that it does not become a mandate on local districts or involve a cost, uh, which would then obviously create some appropriations issues, I, I think that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, if that's responsive to the question through the chair. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Senator Smidian, uh, understanding that today the process is in motion, that we will not take an amendment here in committee today, um, I'm going to ask the next author to consider whether she could pledge to put it in her bill. Your bill would be going back for concurrence on the other side and wouldn't have a chance to be amended, but I just wanted to check as an author of uh, great depth and concern about data collection uh, that you're in concert with this concept of collecting this data. Thank you. I appreciate the courtesy. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, I actually had someone who I want to add as a principal co-author, but it, it, I'm gathering that in the absence of amendments, that's not going to work today. So I'm that, that is correct. That is correct, that. Senator Simeon. What you. we're going to do right now is we're going to call the roll to establish a quorum. Madam Thank Secretary. You, De Leon. Present. Conway. Here. Amiano. Isaac. Calderon. Here. Cotto. Present. Davis. Fuentes, Hall, Present. Harkey, Miller, yes. Nielsen, yes. John Perez, Here. Skinner, Valario, yes. Strickland, yes. Torlickson, Here. Bradford. Here. Great. Great. We've established a quorum. Uh, do we have any witnesses in opposition? Uh, seeing none, uh, DOF, do you have a file? Miriam Ingenita with the Department of Finance. The Department of Finance is opposed to this measure because the department estimates that the annual cost of this bill could be at least $1.5 million for staffing costs related to the review, uh, of the review and approval of the data requests. Additionally, we estimate $500,000 in general fund costs could result from developing appropriate policies and procedures and performing other administrative workload. While the bill does state that this is to be absorbed by the State Department of Education in light of the recent um, budget cuts in 2008 and 2009 and the ongoing fiscal condition of the state's general fund, we are concerned that they would not be able to absorb the, these uh, ex additional costs. Move the bill. Second. Okay, we have a motion. It's been made by Mr. Solorio. It's been second uh, by Mr. Isidore Hall. Uh, Mr. Smedian would like to close. Thank you. Uh, two observations. Uh, first, in response to the comments from the Department of Finance, I think it is important to underscore, as is noted in the analysis, that there is a possibility for folks who are requesting information on a timely basis to pay fees in order to get that information. So we think there's a cost recovery mechanism that's built into the bill. That's correct. The second, as I mentioned earlier, we have $4.9 billion that we've already received members based on our assurances to the federal government that we would have a data system uh, with certain elements in it. 
the last thing we want to do, talk about penny wise and pound foolish, would be to put $4.9 billion in money we've already made assurances on at <coughs> risk because we haven't then <coughs> followed through with our commitment to develop such a system. The next thing is there's a one-time only piece of the $4.5 billion in raised to the top funds. 47 points out of the 500 are based on the adequacy of our data system. So here again, we're not going to be competitive for those dollars if we haven't got a data system worthy of the name. And the last thing, members, on the financial front is there's $245 million specifically set aside in addition to those funds for data program improvements that will be available to states around the country. The hope here is that by having a data system worthy of the name, we would be able to access our fair share of that $245 million. Would ask you to keep all of those things in mind on the finance front. For those who arrived after we began, I just want to emphasize the broad range of support includes not only law enforcement but the business community, uh, including both the LA Chamber of Commerce and the Bay Area Council. And finally, on the finance front, Mr. Chairman, I just want to read a quote that we got today from Rick Hanushek of the Hoover Institute at Stan Stanford, Stanford University, University. well-regarded conservative institute. Institute. I don't get a lot of uh, attaboys from the Hoover Institute, quite frankly. Uh, Mr. Hanushek says, quote, I personally find discussions of the expense of setting this up to be incredible. We have a $60 billion a year enterprise that has no capacity to evaluate what it is doing, end quote. It may not be tactful, but it's cogent. I respectfully ask for an I vote. That's a smooth move on your behalf, Mr. Sumitian, to use the Hoover Institute. Thank you. Uh, before uh, we call the roll, we do have a motion. It's been made by Mr. Solori, and it's been seconded by Isidro Hall. Uh, absent any questions, as I said, we do have a question. Senator? Mr. Chairman, just an observation, and uh, this is uh, nothing at all regarding the author, whom I respect very much, but it's how this legislature does business. You know, it's getting a little wearisome. Very important issues before us. And I read uh, uh, yesterday an analysis of the bill and uh, looked at it again today. And as I sit down here right now, immediately get amendments to look at and analysis to look at as I sit here and we're voting on it in 10 minutes. You know, this institution, and it's not about this bill, it's about the institution. It's a very poor way to do business, folks. Maybe a few stakeholders know what's here what we're dealing with, but I would argue most members don't. And I would say that uh, better ways to do this is have at least 24 hours to read and analyze something, or just a few minutes anyway. Just, just an observation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Calderon, and thank you, Senator um, uh, Nielsen. I, I will say let the, the, the record reflect, if I can get everyone's attention so we can get this bill moving. The uh, amendments proposed today in SB 2X5 uh, were fully vetted and discussed, I believe, in the policy committee yesterday. Uh, we do have a motion uh, by Mr. Solori that we have second by Mr. Isidore Hall. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, please call a Republican roll call. Conway? Aye. Conway, aye. Harkey? Miller? No. Miller, no. Nielsen? No. Nielsen, no. Strickland? Aye. Strickland, aye. Okay, Senator Simidian, congratulations. Uh, your measure passes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee members. Thank you. Ms. Julia Brownlee. Welcome, Ms. Julia Brownlee. How are you uh, doing? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Um, race to the top has garnered a lot of discussion over the last uh, few days, but I just would like to say the guiding principles around AB8 have been first uh, and foremost to do the right thing for California's children, uh, second uh, to be bold and move out of our comfort zone, and last but not least to make sure that we have uh, stakeholder buy-in which underscores the spirit of the Obama administration's reform efforts and we all know that sustainable reform does not happen in isolation. It happens through collaboration, hard work, and buy-in. Ms. Brown, let me just, uh, before you go into the content of your presentation with regards to this measure, uh, so it's stated for the record, uh, your measure AB8 uh, X5 is a due pass as amended recommendation. Uh, the amendments uh, are present, uh, reflected in the analysis uh, of the committee. 
and also uh, it's my understanding, uh, although I was not here yesterday, that the amendments were fully vetted in policy committee yesterday. That's correct. A very lengthy hearing, yes. so yes. please proceed. I, I don't plan on making a lengthy presentation, just to briefly review uh, the key elements of the bill and the, and, and the amendments. If you don't want me to do that, I won't. Go, go right ahead, Ms. Brown. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, AB8, uh, key features of AB8, uh, it allocates, and, and this is one of the most important features, it allocates 80 percent um, of the race to the top funds for local purposes and only allows 20 percent to be retained at the state level. So low achieving and persistently lowest achieving schools will receive money regardless if their districts participate or not. It fully complies with race to the top around national common core standards and alignments of student assessment systems. It targets race to the top funds to high quality professional development and low performing schools. It provides uh, school to school mentoring opportunities and technical assist assistance to the per Thank persistently you. lowest achieving schools. It requires participating districts <coughs> to implement annual evaluations of school principals and requires the intervention and the persistently lowest performing schools consistent with the race to the top guidelines. And last but not least, repeals the cap on the number of charter schools in California and implements several modest charter school accountability and quality control requirements. And the uh, amendments in your analysis uh, include uh, changing the definition of lowest achieving schools to fully comply with race to the top, and two uh, key uh, parent empowerment uh, measures have been added. One for persistently low achieving schools that would require governing boards to hold two public hearings before selecting an intervention model required by Race to the Top with one of the public hearings held at the school site. Um, and also for low achieving schools and particularly in response to the testimony yesterday in the education hearing, uh, the amendments will formalize a process to give parents a voice by requiring governing boards to schedule and hold a hearing on a proposal strategy for reform when 50 percent of the parents at a low achieving school site sign a petition. And last but not least, in, in uh, response uh, to Mr. Solorio uh, and his request, which was an excellent suggestion that the amendments clarify uh, the charter school renewal uh, section. And uh, with that, I will conclude um, my comments and open for questions. The Chair. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair of the Assembly Education Committee. Uh, before we get to the witnesses, uh, I think we have a question or comment from Mr. Amiano. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Brownlee, for all your hard work and, uh, and uh, persistence and fortitude. Just uh, about number four, uh, formalize the process for giving parents a voice. Um, how, how is this a little different than the, the parent trigger thing that they were touting yesterday? In, um, the, this uh, would, would provide, it, it's similar in a lot of ways in that 50% uh, uh, of the parents uh, would trigger um, uh, the, um, would, tr would trigger a public hearing uh, uh, around the issue. Um, and as was stated in yesterday's testimony, the purpose of their language was to give uh, parents a voice and to ensure that there would be a public hearing around this, and that's what the language indeed uh, says in this, in this bill. It does not require the board, uh, the board, once they have a public hearing and the board deliberates, the board has the option to select uh, a reform plan for themselves. Okay. Ms. Brownlee, I see that we have a, a lot of supporters. I'm going to ask uh, the supporters to be very succinct or you can select amongst yourselves uh, who's going to delve a little more deeper into uh, the testimony in support of this measure. Uh, I know we have folks uh, also in opposition. I want to be fair to those individuals uh, also. So for those who are in support, just be uh, uh, cognizant also too that uh, we want to move forward as quickly as possible and get to the floor. 
Erica Hoffman on behalf of the California School Boards Association. I do want to thank the committee yesterday and the committee today for listening to these measures. I appreciate the author's efforts, especially with regards to the issue of the parental involvement. It is a very important component. School board members are very well aware of it. We do appreciate the fact that what this language does provide is that the parents can bring the issue to the board in total for a full discussion without a predetermined outcome. And that provides both sides the ability then to come up with what is an appropriate solution for that school. So we appreciate this. And we would urge, urge your I vote on the measure. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Uh, next witness, Ms. Rucker. Patricia Rucker, California Teachers Association. CTA is supporting this bill in part because there has been a great deal of collaboration and a great deal of effort to hear from all stakeholders. We especially appreciate the conversation that occurred yesterday, and we also believe that adding the parent option is very important. As classroom teachers, our members work very closely with parents in the deliberations and the work to improve not only ha what happens in their classroom, but improving the overall climate and effectiveness of the school. So we're very pleased to see that added measure and that added effort to make sure we're including parents because they do work very closely with our members and we have a stake in knowing that the parents have buy-in to the work that our members are trying to do. Thank you very much. Sherry Griffith with the Association of California School Administrators. We found this to be the most comprehensive plan to implement Race to the Top and in particular to maximize the funding we strongly support 80% going to local districts and schools and 30% to struggling schools in particular. District superintendents are being asked today, this very day, to sign on to this plan yet they have not seen a lot of detail. We think it's extremely critical that we go forward with a funding plan that they can understand and they can submit their MOUs to, so we support the bill. Thank you. Uh, next witness. Uh, Barrett Snyder on behalf of the Franklin McKinley School District in San Jose and Santa Clara County uh, Superintendent Dr. Charles Weiss, supportive of the bill and the amendments. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I know we have a long list of folks. If you could be so kind enough just uh, to identify yourself, maybe perhaps a line, and then let's move on uh, so we can uh, move to uh, those who are in opposition to the measure. Ms. Sanchez. Uh, Dolores Sanchez with the California Federation of Teachers. We have a support if amended position. And uh, first of all, I just want to say how much we appreciate the author's efforts um, with this bill. And uh, the first amendment is uh, our concern has to do with the removal of the uh, cap for uh, charter schools. We're very, uh, we want high quality uh, charter schools and we don't think a removal of the cap uh, goes to that, uh, speaks to that at all. Uh, second of all is the uh, issue with the legislative intent to support performance-based uh, pay. Uh, we have fought long and hard to have a uniform salary schedule and we think this uh, would go in the wrong direction even though it's legislative intent. Thank you. Thank you. Martha Zaragoza Diaz representing the Californians Together Coalition and we also have a support with some suggested amendments that relate to English learners and the inclusion of English language development standards in the core in the core common standards but we feel that this bill um, does focus uh, resources to the schools that need it the most the persistently low performing schools and for that reason we support the bill thank you thank you very much Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I'm Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. Uh, as a nonprofit uh, legal advocacy organization, we represent the civil rights of disenfranchised communities in a number of areas, including education. I'm also authorized to testify in support on behalf of Californians for Justice, a statewide stu student organization, or in support of this bill because we think is the most co comprehensive effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair and members, Khadija Alam on behalf of the Advancement Project in support. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Chris Reef on behalf of State Superintendent of Public Construction, Jack O'Connell. The superintendent had a supportive amendment position on the previous version, has not had an opportunity to, re uh, to review the current amendments in full. So the position that he's taken is in regards to the previous version. Thank you. Right, thank you. Mr. Chairman. I, Mr. Torlakson. This ahead. might be appropriate time because I see Mr. Jones uh, approaching the mic uh, to restate the question I asked the earlier uh, author of the earlier bill to the, again, tremendous, incredible work you've done, uh, Chairwoman Bromley from the Education Committee. We heard a lot on a bipartisan basis uh, in the testimony on your bill yesterday about career technical education, the American Competes Act, and uh, there is a language that's been developed by uh, the uh, California business teachers of California, by the building trades, by Get Real, that asks uh, consideration in, in this form, intent of the legislature, an amendment to your bill that could be taken 
in the other house if the author agrees and accepts. It is the intent of this uh, legislation to ensure that data elements are put in place to analyze the effectiveness and analyze uh, career technical education programs in terms of enrollment and, and where it's going. I think you've seen some of the language. Would you accept it as an author's amendment on the other side? If we can't do it today, apparently uh, we can't do it today. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll be happy to, um, I thank you for your work um, on that and would be happy to um, accept those amendment, uh, amendments as you have stated them and include them in the intent language of the bill. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That, okay, that thank helps. you, uh, Mr. Strongson and Ms. Brownlee. Uh, Mr. Cardo. Yes, just a, just a comment. Uh, just a comment about item number four on the amendments. Uh, the business about formalizing a process for giving parents a voice by requiring a governing board to, upon a petition by 50% of the parents at a low performing school, uh, scheduled and hold a, a hearing on a strategy for reform. The the idea of trying to get 50% of any kind of parents in the school to do a petition or even show up in a meeting seems to be a very daunting type of a task. Did you think about that? Well, uh, I, I agree with you, and I, I hope, uh, I think any good uh, governing board uh, would, uh, before parents would be required to collect 50% uh, of the uh, parents uh, within a school population signature that they would uh, respond uh, to the concerns uh, of a smaller uh, percentage of parents. But uh, we uh, wanted to make sure that it was a preponderance uh, of parents that um, would have a concern as opposed to just responding to uh, you know, a few. Uh, which can happen, as as you know, as a superintendent. Um, and so we we uh, mimicked what was in the um, uh, Senate bill on this, which was the 50%, um, and believe that it uh, 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 would uh, do what it's intended to do, which is to make sure that parents have a voice and and boards will respond to them. Okay, wait, we actually have Ms. Strickland and then um, Senator Calero. Ms. Strickland? Just a quick comment. I'm really concerned that um, these attempts here are really just trying to reach a bare minimum of what President Obama is actually seeking for from uh, the states. Um, this proposal, when I read it, it doesn't really look like a race competing against other states for what are precious education dollars. You know. This is not some massive decisive shift in policy. It really just looks like more of the same, more of California's, you know, continuation of their meander toward mediocrity, frankly. Um, the parental empowerment provisions are weak at best. I mean, it takes a jab at the independence of charter schools under the guise of supporting them. And frankly, our children have one chance, one chance to be able to compete <coughs> in an international market, and I don't believe that this legislation better equips any of our children to do that. Uh, this looks like a race our children are going to lose, and I can't support this bill. Okay, I think we have all the witnesses uh, in support that already testified. Let's go to witnesses in opposition. Oh, if you, oh I'm sorry. While they come on down, uh, Senator Calderon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, I have to, uh, this is just intuitively, uh, you're not going to get 50% of the parents ever to complain about anything. I mean, if it's, maybe if it's sex education in the schools at one point in time, I mean, you know, but, um, but to get 50% is going to be pretty difficult. And uh, have you made any, any effort to determine whether or not this actually meets federal guidelines? It does not, it, well, it, it, I don't think there's any reason for it not to meet uh, federal guidelines. I, at first, I thought you were going to say the federal regulations with race to the top. It, it, it is not something that's required uh, within uh, the regulations uh, of race to the top. But you have to remember that this is about schools that are failing. When you talk about, and I understand your point about you know, parents rally around sex education or something, but when 
their children's schools are failing, I think that you, it's not going to be that difficult uh, to rally the troops. I mean, this is about their children. Uh, it is about their one opportunity, as Ms. Strickland said, um, about their education. So I really do believe that uh, it does have uh, a, a merit in terms of giving um, schools uh, the choice. I, you know, there is also another measure in there as well with regards to, as the race to the top regulations define as the persistently lowest performing schools, which are our, our worst performing schools in California. And we also have regulations in there about um, having public hearings and school board meetings and having it at a particular school site so that all parents uh, can participate. And this is when a school has to make a very significant decision about a very strict reform. I mean, when you talk about their, th this bill is, is plain vanilla, we're talking about um, closing schools down, uh, firing principals, and, and uh, replacing 50% of the staff. I mean, we're talking about some very significant things here in terms of turning around schools, and what we're trying to do is making sure that the parents have a very uh, equal voice uh, in the decisions in the process. Let me just beg to differ, 50, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I need to support my, my point of view, and you know, 50% of over 50 schools in my, in the major uh, school district in my district, Montebello Unified, are in, per, are in um, a personal improvement. I mean, and the parents don't know. They don't, they don't know. Um, they have no idea. And, um, uh, and the real question is, um, you know, what what kind of parent involvement are you looking for with a 50% threshold? Well, your point is well taken. Uh, I, I want to tell you that the language in here uh, was suggested by a parent group out of Los Angeles, uh, but by, who? Uh, by a parent group in uh, Los Angeles. For LA Unified. Uh, the group is. Uh, uh, it's called, uh, it's an organized group called Parents Revolution. Um, but uh, I, uh, let me just say that, again, if this bill uh, moves out of this committee today and moves off of the floor later and as it moves to the Senate, I think this is a, a, an area uh, certainly that we can we can look at. Uh, I, I mean, again, going back to Mr. Uh, my response to Mr. Cotto, I, I mean, I, I would hope that there's not a condition of which this would have to be utilized. But this is sort of a safety net to make sure uh, that a school board, if they're not responding to parents, that they do indeed respond to parents. And maybe we have to, well, maybe we have to look at, 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 at that threshold. Ms. Brownlee, why don't we uh, go to the witnesses in opposition? I will say that. Uh, it's my understanding, at least, that uh, Parent Revolution is a, a grassroots organization that's been associated with the charter school movement uh, in the greater uh, Los Angeles area. So we have uh, a handful of witnesses in, in opposition. Uh, where do we start? Catherine Gaither, Governor's Office of Education, um, testifying on behalf of the administration. The administration is opposed to this bill. And I did have a very brief moment to glance at the amendments that you provided to the Department of Finance representative. We had not seen it before walking into the hearing. And I can say that our concerns are still the same as yesterday. The definitions do not meet the race of the top guidelines, the definitions of low performing schools. The restrictions on charter schools are inconsistent with race of the top guidelines. The overly prescriptive nature of the funding allocation and requirements, again, inconsistent with race of the top guidelines. The administration cannot support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Mr. Chair, members Rand Martin on behalf of the California Charter Schools Association. We share the concerns about not having seen the amendments and Senator Nielsen made a comment about uh, some stakeholders may have seen the amendments. Well, I can assure you that some stakeholders have not seen the amendments. Um, and uh, we do know from the description that it's very different than what we supported in uh, Senator Romero's bill yesterday in, in assembly education. We're also very concerned about the fiscal consequences of this bill. It does, as the governor's office indicated, reduce our competitive, um, competitiveness in the uh, 
race to the top uh, competition. Um, it also has you know, unintended consequences um, that uh, we've just, we've just uh, realized as we've continued to analyze this bill. Um, there is a program on the federal level that provides uh, California uh, up to $50 million in startup grants for new charter schools. Um, the laws surrounding that prohibit um, the designation of populations um, in that startup. So you cannot identify which kinds of students that you want to have in that school. It has to be a random lottery-based um, mechanism. Um, this bill requires us to uh, define a population of students similar to the population that is in, um, uh, in the area of the, of the charter school. That kind of definition would make us no longer eligible for that $50 million in startup grants. And for those reasons and the policy reasons we raised yesterday in Assembly Education, we ask for your opposition. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next witness in opposition. Uh, Bill Lucia uh, from Ed Voice. Uh, we, we remain opposed. Um, we've been opposed yesterday, we still are opposed. Wanted to point out to you that on page 63 of the bill, it creates a standards R process to, to adopt the standards and it put, uh, thus the delegation of legislative authority to the superintendent of public instruction uh, to adopt standards and the board to approve them within a month, in the month of August of 2010, while you all are on vacation. And it would require you all to come back from vacation in a two-thirds vote to stop anything. If you, if you weren't willing to go with the, the redesign of textbooks, curriculum frameworks, uh, instruction, you know, all the instruction materials, all the assessments, to retool everything that California has spent several hundred millions of dollars on since 1997 when the standards were last adopted. So we, uh, from, a, from a fiscal standpoint, we uh, beg you to take careful caution about what you vest in one person with no public hearing the ability to commit the state of California to do. Um, finally, and, I, and I, I won't belabor the other points, you've, you've I'm sure seen our letter. I have to say though, if you um, bear with me, um, as Bill Lucia, parent of five, uh, I just want to say in words that maybe Mr. Cotto and Mr. Calderon can understand, fíjate. This, this parent thing, it, it changes si se puede to no se puede. Right now, that language, the way it's drafted in this bill compared to what was talked about yesterday with a room full of parents, fíjate. The Brown Act, three days. This bill, 90 days. Yesterday, something's gonna happen. Today, you sit on your hands to watch the circus and all you get is a hearing. You get less out of this bill. Right now, you can go as a parent to the next regularly scheduled board meeting during public comment and tell them what you think. You're gonna tell a bunch of parents, some of them that are here undocumented, that you have to sign a petition with your name on it to be able to talk to the school board about what you think needs to be fixed about your school, fíjate. Next witness. Mr. Chairman, members, Scott Governor, um, uh, here for, uh, there been, well, I apologize for the outfit first, I'm filling in for my brother who's watching his children today. Uh, for Parent Revolution, the language in question concerning the trigger, we have not seen this language. It does not sound uh, like something we would support. It is inconsistent with the Senate bill, so I just want to to correct uh, perhaps a mischaracterization of our position on this trigger language for charter schools. It is not what we proposed and it is not the same as the Senate bill, at least based on what we've heard. We have not seen the language. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no other witnesses, uh, any other questions that we may have from members, Mr. Calderon? I, I mean, is it possible to simply, t I, I, I guess you're not taking any amendments, but we're, we're taking these, why, why don't you just make this 25%? 50% is tough to justify. It's tough to defend uh, that, that this is parent involvement. Especially, I mean, you have, you have uh, a um, residual fear of institutions stemming from La Migra, which, um, uh, you know, is, are, is the immigration uh, officials. I mean, I, why, why are we opposed to having, you know, parent involvement? I mean, we're always talking about getting the parents more involved in the, in the program. I realize you don't want a group of noisy parents to tube an otherwise responsible program, 
but but we should have uh, you know a, a goal that's a little bit more attainable in, in terms in, in the real world uh, yeah I, I hear you mr. Calderon if you read through the 70 plus 80 plus pages of this bill you will find in almost every section of the bill something around parent involvement uh, these two areas are areas that we're just trying to underscore emphasize um, and create that I hear what you're saying about the percentage and I am uh, I commit to you I'm happy uh, to as we move forward on this process to reevaluate um, that percentage point but this language was written around the testimony that we heard from parents yesterday at this hearing I'm not saying it was the exact language uh, the, they did not submit language to us but it was designed around the testimony that we heard at the hearing uh, yesterday to right, support but it, that parent we're, we're policymakers you know a lot I, of us are former school board members uh, I am as we, well. We don't, we're not going to, I mean, you don't sit there, parents come and say, well, we ought to have at least 50% involvement. You go, uh, okay. Oh, okay. You know, this is not saying you have to have it, as Mr. Lucia even said, any parent can come into a, at a school board meeting and talk in public comments. And as I said, a responsible school board member would respond to a group of parents who are upset or angry and deliberate on what their issue is and take in all, all of the issues surrounding uh, surrounding a particular uh, issue. That's Mr. what Brownlee. the responsible school board should do. But this is to ensure uh, that there's buy-in. But maybe we need to look at the percentage. Why don't we do this? We're not going to have a, a colloquy. We have one more witness that we will recognize. Uh, that's the witness. If you could be so kind of to be brief in your comments. Uh, we have one more question uh, or commentary. Let's do that, and then we're going to hopefully entertain a motion, move this. Nonetheless, I do want to underscore uh, what Mr. Calderon's comments and uh, perhaps uh, a few others here. If, if they want to continue this discussion, by all means, there's another house uh, in this building where if there's any amendments or there's a consensus, if there's agreement to this, uh, in the Absolutely. future, then that vehicle can be uh, utilized still, nonetheless. Please. Mr. Chairman and members of this committee, I'm Malachi Sekou Amen of the California State NAACP, and I'm here on behalf of our 52 branches and our 30 youth and college division units in the state of California. We're here on behalf of the African American, the Latino, the Native American, the Asian, and the poor white students who continue to be trapped in California's failing schools. We have over 3,000 failing schools in California. Ooh, let's hold back. Let's hold you know back. I, I, and, and I really appreciate, and probably I agree with your commentary. But Mr. What Chairman, I want to do, hold on one second. Exactly, respectfully. I want to keep our comments germane to the fiscal nature of this committee. Okay. We have plenty of opportunity, I believe, on the floor debate through the individuals who are present here on both sides of the aisle to come up with any concerns also when it gets over to the Senate side. But because this is a fiscal committee, I want to be stick to the fiscal nature of this measure. If you have concerns on the fiscal issues, please have them there. I'm more than happy to have them heard. I if it's into the policy, uh, I'm going to say I'm not trying to take away your opinions because I know your opinions are very important. You feel very passionate about them. I think that another vehicle could be utilized, whether through a member on the floor or on the other side when it gets to the Senate, I believe sometime uh, next week. So if you got okay, a fiscal. I, I will speak to fiscal issues, okay. but it's important to point out that we haven't had an opportunity to speak on either the policy or the fiscal issues. But the policy, if you had if you had the opportunity, this, didn't these exist. These proceedings have yeah. occurred. It won't happen today is what I'm saying to you. And I apologize okay. to you. I don't know what the process was yesterday. Okay, I will just there. say this. It's a crime to pass this bill today. And we beg you, we urge each and every one of you to go back to the negotiating table on behalf of the least of these. Our schools are separate and unequal still, even after the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. And it would be a crime to pass this bill. And the NAACP opposes this bill. Thank right, you. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Let's go to DOF. And then I think we have a question commentary. And let's wrap this up. Go ahead. Chairman, members of the committee, Miriam and Janita with the Department of Finance. Uh, the Department of Finance is opposed to this measure. It does not follow the model for the race to the top 
uh, pro program and could jeopardize our ability to access $700 million in race to the top funds. Okay, last question. Can I, ask Can I just ask, a, Ms. Brownlee, um, back to the parental involvement, um, page 11 of the bill talks about how you have to have half of um, the parents sign on. Does that also include, it looks to me by this bill that you also have 50% of the teachers that right. also have to then be uh, saying that they want the school to be uh, become a charter school is that that's so you have the 50 percent hurdle for the the parents and then you also have a 50 percent hurdle for the teachers to also sign on before then this can come before the board I'm sorry what line item are you looking at on page 11 page 11 um, looking around 32 to 39 uh, 32 okay okay Okay, yeah, this is, uh, in this section, this is uh, regarding charter schools, and uh, in this particular section that you're referencing is existing law about uh, the, the, the process for um, establishing a charter school. Okay, so, and that would be continued under your bill? So uh, that no, you no, we're, we're, uh, we're not, uh, we're uh, not, yeah, I mean, this is just an acknowledgement of what existing uh, law is. The other parent component piece uh, is uh, is that we were speaking of is when schools, whether they be charter or traditional public schools, when they are the persistently lowest performing schools, and in our bill we also define low performing schools because we have so many schools, but we had to define the worst of the worst, uh, and and then we wanted to add additional schools that really need attention. I'm saying for, the, for those particular schools, they have this engagement process of which uh, the, a school board would be required um, uh, to uh, evaluate a reform plan for low performing schools and for persistently low in performing schools, these, these uh, definitions are important. Uh, then the parents have to be engaged when a school board uh, decides one of four um, intervention models that need to be decided upon by the race to the top regulations uh, and school and, and parents would have uh, a, you know a seat at the table and a voice in that process as the board uh, deliberates um, over that and those and those are uh, uh, re reverting a school to a charter school it could be closing a school it could be uh, a, a, a firing a, a principal and reestablishing 50 percent of the staff. Do you anticipate the charter schools having a seat at the table in the discussion uh, as it relates to the education audits appeal panel? The, the appeals panel, we had a long discussion about this uh, yesterday, but that process, the one that is referenced in this bill, mimics uh, the same process uh, for traditional public schools, which is an open, uh, an open uh, process where uh, any and all can participate. Well, I see that your bill stipulates it's that uh, the State Department it's of Education has representatives, the School Board Association has representatives, the Association of School Business Officers. I'd like to move the bill. Uh, that, that's the, the process in existing yeah. law for traditional I, I schools. That, but as we talk Let's, uh, about PTA, we'll slow down the CPA. just a little bit. We got a motion, let the record stand, and we have a motion that's been made by Mr. Isidore Hall. It's been seconded by uh, Mr. Jose Solorio. I think there's going to be plenty of time, and I do anticipate a robust uh, uh, debate uh, when we get to the floor because we will go to the Mr. floor. Mr. Chairman, what is the committee after. for? This is given a short shrift even to the committee. Mr. Samedian, what is uh, the Mr. committee Samedian, for, Mr. Sorry. Chairman? Uh, Senator, if you can just hold on one quick second. I wasn't finished with Ms. Strickland, so I'd ask you to put it on pause and just relax for a quick second. What I'm saying right now is immediately upon gaveling down after a vote, we're going to go down to the floor immediately thereafter. I'm sure and I anticipate we'll have a very robust debate. Now, going to Ms. Strickland, it can just finish up your last question. We have a motion as well as a second, and we're going to finalize this debate. Thank you. I understand this as relates to charters, or excuse me, to traditional schools, that those are the people that are normally in place. But as, le as we are dealing with charter schools, it seems to me only fair that those people who are most invested in their success are the people who are part of the charter schools themselves. It, it seems ridiculous that we would not have anyone from the Charter Schools Association be a part of those stakeholders. 
Can you explain that rationale? Well, again, uh, the only uh, you know response I can give you is that we have m mimicked. Right now, charter schools have no financial accountability. We're trying to put some modest uh, financial accountability uh, in. We mimicked what we, the process uh, that um, a traditional public school has to do with regards to the audit. Uh, so are you considering amendments then as you develop a system to audit charter schools to include charter school representatives on the Charter the process, audit panel? Uh, the, the process that is established in Ed Code is a process which is an open process of which uh, charter school uh, participants or charter school um, You're offering them an open mic in an auditorium, not a seat at the table. That's the same complaint that our parents Chair, are having. Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, call for the question. Okay, let's finalize uh, this question. I, I do want to say again, I just want to emphasize that for Ms. Strickland as well as Senator Nielsen that there'll be plenty of time to have a very, very robust uh, dialogue on this issue. We do have a motion that's been made by Mr. Isidore Hall. It's been seconded by uh, Mr. Jose Solorio. Question, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, the maker of the motion, uh, uh, does, the, was the intent or, or was a part of the intent in making the motion that the, the, the uh, author would relook at that 50% threshold that we mentioned a second ago? Uh, absolutely, I believe the author said that she uh, would I, do I, so. I, I, I am committed to looking at that as this bill that moves out of this committee and moves to the floor and moves on to the Senate to look at that. Right, well, thank you. Motion. Fantastic, thank you much, Ms. Uh, Brownlee. We have a motion again. Uh, this measure passes on a B roll call, uh, Mr. Ms. Calderon. Ms. Oh. Go ahead, Ms. Brownlee. I just want to qualify my vote. I'm going to, I'm going to support it to the floor, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to support it on the floor with this language. This language makes your entire proposal look disingenuous, and I'm worried. I'm worried about that. Makes it makes me want to now really look closely at every, every provision, much closer than I am already. I will support it, and I'll, I'll, I'll follow the chairman's recommendation and debate it on the floor, but. Um, I, I just think this threshold is indefensible. It's indefensible. Thank you, Ms. Calderon. Ms. Brownlee, you wanted to finalize your comment before? Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, one thing in conclusion, and that is really to... Um, we, we've already given her to take the vote, right? No, I just want to acknowledge uh, Kimberly Rodriguez and her work um, and, and, so, and help in this bill. And Kimberly also went to a, a meeting in Denver uh, just a few days ago, which helped in the technical assistance so that we could ensure that this bill uh, was a competitive bill uh, to meet all of the regulations in Race to the Top. And I, and I just wanted to thank her um, for that. Okay. Uh, and with thank that, you, of course, I respectfully ask thank you. for Thank you vote. so much. Again, we have a motion as well as Second, just for the record, uh, this measure passes on a B roll call. Uh, immediately thereafter, when we conclude this committee, we will go straight to the floor. Uh, this concludes the business before this committee. And Thank you. Committee is adjourned. Thank you.